22 here on Kiwi. Time to get some opinions from the man at publicaddress.net. Of course, it's Russell Brown with the hard news blog there, Media 7 Show, TVNZ7. Morning, Russell. And uh, first up uh, today, talking about um, the uh, the moves over, quite extraordinary moves over over the Tasman. Uh, the Foreign Affairs Minister and a bunch of other prominent Australians um, have supported a, uh, a report prepared by Australia 21 uh, that has come to the conclusion that tough law and order approaches to drugs are doing more harm than good. In fact, this um, this pits the Foreign Affairs Minister Bob Carr against Julia Gillard, who said. That uh, no, it's tough policing. Tough policing is what we need, Russell. Yeah, because that's, that's worked really well so far. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. Um, th- this is kind of—I mean, we've seen this before. Uh, yeah, almost every report of this kind ends up deciding that the current approach isn't working, uh, that you can't prosecute drugs out of existence, uh, and that's what this one says as well. And then it gets ignored. Yeah, well, not just ignored, but but very publicly squashed, uh, and that's what Julia Gillard's done. Um, Bob Carr, who's the former New South Wales Premier, uh, agreed to be part of the development of this report before he was made Foreign Affairs mm. Minister. Mm. Uh, so it's slightly embarrassing for the government that uh, you know, now he is. So he's obviously you know, he's a prominent minister now. Uh, but to his credit, he hasn't tried to sh- shirk it or, or you know, duck away from it. But, yeah, basically, the, you know, the prohibition of illicit drugs is killing and criminalising our children, and we are letting it happen. Uh, and it seems like a pretty solid report. Mm. Uh, it was interesting, uh, Bob Carr himself, uh, in the report, uh, notes that when he was New South Wales Premier, he was always concerned about the police there um, basically charging into railway stations with sniffer dogs, yeah. randomly trying to find anyone who might have some marijuana on them. And you really have to question that as a policing priority. Yeah. Uh, and, the, of course, the police uh, in Australia have done the same sort of thing um, using dogs again uh, outside uh, big festivals like the Big Day Out, uh, which doesn't appear to have stopped anyone taking drugs there. It has sent a few kids to hospital uh, because they've panicked and necked all their drugs and, and you know, nearly died. Mm, mm. Um, but, yeah, it, it, is, it is somewhat depressing. I mean, we've seen similar things here on a smaller scale with a succession of uh, parliamentary select committee uh, investigations into marijuana law, which invariably find that, that the law needs to be reformed and that uh, that you should be decriminalised. And it never goes anywhere. It, it's like, you know, it's clearly such regarded as such political poison uh, that um, the senior leadership of any political party, even, even a left-wing one, will... Um, Basically, make a very public display of sitting on it. So I guess I guess the politicians, both from Labor and National, don't see it as their responsibility to educate the public on the actual facts of how the law works and the actual facts of um, drug-related harm. So in that case, whose job is it to educate the public so that when the politicians do want to tackle it, they've got the public on side? Yeah, I don't know. I I guess it would be the news media, uh, which haven't always done a good job on this. Um, but it, it is interesting um, that I've spoken to uh, someone who, who was quite high up, or very high up, in um, the kind of future gazing risk assessment uh, type role at um, a major government entity. And he said that everyone at, at his level of government agencies pretty much agrees that drug law has to be changed, mm. that it's, it's destructive and wasteful the way it is. Uh, and you know, so, so it's not like the work hasn't been done. It uh, is just, yeah, it, it never never reaches the public, basically. OK, well, let's focus on Media 7 this week, where you're looking at uh, Christian media. Yeah, it being Easter. Um, so, yeah, we actually thought you know, this might be a nice way of handling it. And um, I, I'm actually quite looking forward to the show. We're recording it this evening, beyond 9.05pm tomorrow, um, with uh, some prominent Christian broadcasters. A guy called Phil Guyon, who's from the Christian Broadcasting Association, which... I hadn't realised until until we started researching this how much they do. They've got a very established relationship with News Talk ZB, supply programming. Uh, they also work with the likes of Rob Harley and Petra Baggist. Uh, and it, it's kind of interesting that the, there seems to be an increasing flow both ways uh, between Christian and secular media. And, and it actually seems like it's quite a good thing. You, you're seeing Radio Rima now not just be wall-to-wall evangelism. Yeah, uh, you've got Pat Brittenden, who's a good broadcaster now. Now does mornings on on Radio Rima, 
uh, and even has you know unbelievers on the likes of David Slack and uh, tomorrow morning me actually huh. talking about our show, which I'm quite looking forward to. So it is. I think it's encouraging to see someone like um, Pat Brittenden. Um, taking a role in those sorts of things. Re- recently listening to an episode of Media Watch on national radio, I heard some pretty um, radical kind of right-wing talk going on on Radio Rima. Yeah, was Radio that... Rima. This, well, Bob McCoskey was there, uh, right. of course. And, um, you know, Radio Rima, I think some of what has, you know, goes on there still is, is um, not at all to my taste. And, and it, it does, I mean, this is something I'll put to the panellists, that... Um, I'm not sure whether the obsessive focus on a, a narrow definition of morality is actually what Jesus would have done. I think he would have been a little more concerned about economic and social equity than these people are. So, um, so but, but if someone like Pat doesn't consider himself a uh, Christian broadcaster, the, what is the role of Rima? What's, what's, the, what's going uh, on? Well, it, it, I mean, Rima is, yeah, it, it's a, absolutely a, an evangelical Christian radio station, but I, I think it's interesting that, well, no, see, Pat, Pat is a Christian, uh, but does not consider himself a, in quotes, Christian broadcaster. And we've actually come across this in, in our research for the show quite a few times. People don't, you know, yeah, it's like you, you, don't want to be, you don't want to be a Christian rock band. This, something about about putting uh, you know, that in the first word of a title seems to um, uh, seems to ruin things, frankly. Right. But um, yeah, no, I'm I'm quite looking forward to this. We've also got Lavinia Natoka, who's the news editor of Challenge, Challenge Weekly, which is the weekly Christian newspaper, which has been going for a long time. Um, and also Richard Randerson, the former dean of Holy Trinity Church in Auckland, who's the the kind of uh, touchy feely Anglican liberal voice in the media. Uh, who, to be fair, often gets drowned out by voices like those of Bob McCoskey and, mm. and you know, and even Brian Tamaki. Mm. Uh, and I think it, it is maybe difficult for a um, a more reasonable and liberal Christian voice to get heard. Okay. Uh, well, finally, um, let's pick up on this issue about um, Cameron Brewer's views on the retail character of Queen Street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is mostly about Cameron Brewer's desperate need for attention so he can run for mayor at some point. Uh, he has criticised what he regards as a proliferation of, um, of shoebox shops in and around Queen Street in Auckland. Um, certainly on Queen Street, you're not seeing many of those. And even if you are, um, why does why does Queen Street have to look like um, Newmarket yeah. or a shopping mall? I yeah. don't think it does. It's a market, uh, and those shops have sprung up, and you know, in response to market conditions, uh, and. There is, there's a, there's a veiled race element here. I mean, I, I thought it was actually a bit poor that the so-called retail experts quoted by the Herald uh, saying that uh, some of these shops may have been set, uh, maybe being set up uh, to get around immigration laws. Really? Crikey. Yeah. Um, I, I think if someone's going to say that, you should actually quote them by name so you yeah. can see who the hell they are. Yeah. I mean, surely, um, even if you're a shoebox shop on Queen Street, the rent can't be that low. No, it's not, and I think it's possibly, you know, that, that would be a driver. Um, if the rents are too high, then um, you take a smaller space and squeeze in. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's not, someone made a comparison to Cuba Street. It's not Cuba Street. You know, it's not all funky and bohemian chic. Uh, you know, it's, it's a bit chintzy in places. But, you know, I, I think Queen's, there's a lot more life on Queen Street than there was five years ago. Well, as long as it's something more useful than a damn souvenir shop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, the souvenir shops are pretty dull, aren't yeah. they? I, I, how, how often do I go buy sheep, you know, sheepskins? Yeah, and, and yep, exactly. <laughs> Poonamu. Um, <laughs> now, uh, in that post on Public Address, the post is called The Golden Mile, and um, I've managed to, with the help of a couple of librarians, uh, find a link to uh, Auckland's uh, original 1841 plan yeah. drawn up by Felton Matthews, and uh, there's a link to a big version of that. And if people haven't seen this before, I think they'll be kind of amazed by what the original plan for Auckland was. Uh, concentric circles. It's, it's, a pretty, it's, it's pretty wild, actually. It would have been quite fun. I don't know how practical it would have been. Yeah, and based, what, down by the waterfront? No, no, up on, up on the hill by the university. Ah. Basically, uh, pretty much centred on the fountain in Albert Park. Yeah. Uh, and, and a so-called circus of streets radiating away from that, which is why Waterloo Quadrant is called Waterloo Quadrant. 
up there. It's sort of one, that's one of the vestiges of, of that original plan. Hard to do in a silly in a um, hilly sort of area. Yeah, yeah, oh, <laughs> totally. It would have been. Yeah. If they pulled it off, it would have been marvellous. Yeah. But uh, it, yeah, it's it's quite quite an interesting idea. Um, and yeah, it's nice that that sort of thing is sitting around on the library websites. And it wasn't under copyright, so I was able to put it on our website. Isn't that the story of Auckland, though? If they had pulled it off, it would have been marvellous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, Queen Street was never meant to be uh, the Golden Mile. No. Uh, it's a, it was an open sewer. It was, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, people, rather than do what the plan is, you know, wanted them to do, people built their houses alongside yeah, the open sewer. Set up a village. Yeah, and, oh, and one more thing on that tip, um, just yesterday uh, tra- tra- Auckland Transport Blog uh, have put up some impressions and details about what an Aotea Square station might look like on the um, uh, proposed and desperately needed city rail link, mm. and it's really worth a look. Is uh, it underground? Trans- um, oh yeah, but, yeah, underground, yeah. yeah. Um, transportblog.co.nz. It's really interesting, actually. Cool. Check it out. Thank you very much, Russell. Cheers. Russell Brown at publicaddress.net. It's the hard news blog there, Media 7 Show, TVNZ.